Right, folks. So getting back into computer music, right? Uh, checking in. So I've been talking to you about doing the Max tutorials. We it's been seven days since I issued a challenge to you to do two a day. So you should be about fourteen tutorials into the tutorials. Uh, how's that going? I don't have fourteen. I got ten done. Okay, cool. Uh, Again, I'm looking for about 25 on each on the Mac side, 25 on the MSP side, so you can kind of get through these. And you should see, let's, I'll put it this way, uh, if you're thinking ahead about your project topics, project ideas, you should see some patches that bear that have similar titles to the topics that I gave you for your um, your actual projects. So um, that will help you along. Okay, uh, we are moving into our research projects. Uh, I, I anticipate that today and Tuesday will be the last two days that I'm like talk, talk, talk for most of the class and I will then Thursday and Tuesday sit and work, meet with groups and just kind of work through uh, where you are with your projects and help you further things along. Um, but in one week, okay, each group, this is not each person, but each group must uh, submit an annotated bibliography to me uh, uh, for your project, okay. Uh, I'll get to a minute as far as like what what needs to be on that. And actually, I'll, I'll get to that last because I want to do uh, Mac stuff first, then project stuff toward the end of class, okay? Um, so don't don't freak out about the annotated bibliography just yet, okay? This is not pages and pages of stuff. I, I, I expect it to be done in a week, so therefore it needs to be, man I rec fully recognize it needs to be a manageable task for one week, okay? Um, and your presentations will be in two weeks. There's only three groups, so we should be able to do three presentations in one class. That's That's my... Uh, plan as of right now, okay, to have you in two weeks giving presentations on your patch that you're going to be starting to build here, okay. I fully recognize that that's a short turnaround here, uh, and I fully recognize that that's, we're very early in your max careers at this point, this moment in time, okay. Um, the, the, the key here is repetition. The idea is that the, the project format stays virtually the same from, pro from project to project, but the repetition will help you get better at these tasks of researching a topic, implementing it in Max, and developing an instrument and present, presenting that to the class, okay? Um, so topics that we talked about for last time, okay? Uh, we had rough quadrants that I've d uh, developed here, and I think a lot of these terms, or at least the, the, yeah, the variations on these terms, come out of the reading that you guys are supposed to do for Monday, okay? So you'll be reading descriptions about these in, in uh, your textbook for Monday. Um, again, our textbook is not an end-all, be-all description of how to implement these things. So you're going to have to kind of do some research in addition to what's in the book, in addition to what's in the tutorials in order to fully implement these things. Okay, um, I will say I'm not expecting you to, uh, I want to be clear on this point, I'm not expecting you to explain every subcategory in your quadrant. Okay, let me say that again. I'm not expecting you to explain every subcategory in your quadrant, okay? And if you're scrambling to write these down, this graph is actually on Blackboard. If you click on the Synthesis and MIDI folder, that you can see this whole graph. Just know which quadrant you're in, basically, okay? So I'm not expecting uh, Leo and Colby to talk about Digital Waveguide and CarPlus Strong and Exciter Resonator and Mass Spring Models and FOF, okay? Uh, I'm expecting you to research physical models, decide on what's implementable in a two-week span, what are the resources you're going to do that, and then get up here and give a presentation. So if you pick CAR plus strong as the algorithm, okay, I would be very happy if you picked one, maybe two to implement. Okay, um, So if you guys pick CAR plus strong, you give a presentation to the class, what is the CAR plus strong algorithm, where does it come from, what is the timeline, um, you know, who are the principal p players that were involved in, in uh, uh, bringing it about? Hint, that one of them's named Carplus, one of them's named Strong, okay, uh, in this case. Um, and talk about other places where it shows up, what it's good for, what is it not good for, and then show us your Carplus Strong implementation, okay? So it's a full kind of, you're teaching us a little bit about your technique that you researched, okay? Not just showing us your instrument, but also the the derivation of the technique okay um, there's quite a bit of overlap in the modulation distortion I could easily see the modulation distortion group tech you know having a amplitude and frequency modulator 
patch, basically, okay? And you're controlling them with different uh, processes. Uh, let's see, for spectral models, I could easily see a combination of additive and subtractive synthesis, okay? Um, but I'll get into more of those specifics as we do Q&A sessions a uh, week from today and a week from Tuesday, okay? Those are, those are the days, the classes that I'm anticipating will just be Q&A, me bouncing from group to group, Dylan bouncing from group to group. Uh, we can kind of multiply our efforts and uh, go from there, okay? But I am expecting you to do some research to get going on this. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of class because I said that's what I was going to do. Uh, a couple concepts that have kind of fallen between the cracks, okay? Um, and just thinking through what we talked about last time, I just wanted to kind of make mention of these. The idea of hot versus cold inlets, this is talked about in some of the tutorials, and so you may have encountered this idea that uh, certain inlets will cause an output from an object, as opposed to certain inlets will cause only the internal state to change, but no output to become. And the way the tutorial described this is hot versus cold inlets. Um, so hot being that it causes an output to happen, and cold meaning that it just changes the internal state, but no output actually comes out of the object. We'll hopefully get a chance to re to cap uh, to to uh, observe that in some of the stuff we'll do today with MIDI. Uh, the other thing is order of operations. Uh, the fact that uh, in a text-based programming environment, right, it's pretty clear that things happen from top to bottom, right. Okay, and so we're reading through the lines sequentially, and that's the order that things happen. The question in a graphical programming environment, what order do things happen? You have to decide, basically. Uh, max, it's right to left, and top to, uh, bottom to top is actually the order that things happen in max. Okay, so if you're thinking about your max patch, you can think of it from the right bottom corner to the top left corner, and that's the order that things are going to happen. Okay. Most of the time, this will be invisible to you, and it won't really matter. But there are some times where you think something's going to ha you, you think one thing's going to happen, and actually, because of this, it, primarily because of right to left ordering, um, it's actually happening in the wrong order. And so, uh, I'll just use an example. If you're doing a running subtraction of multiple inputs that are coming in, you think that. It's subtract. It, we we typically do subtraction left to right, right? If I say two minus three. You're 2, then minus 3. You're reading that from left to right. But if those inputs are arriving in max, it, there's a potential that they're arriving in a right to left order. And so as it's being updated, so say the first time it's 2 minus 3, but then the, the first variable changes and now it's 4 minus 3. Okay, um, it's a, There's a potential that things are arriving in an order that you're that is unexpected. Again, we'll see this play out a couple times, but those are concepts I didn't, that kind of, fell between the cracks last class and hopefully I'll get a chance to implement them or to demonstrate them today. If not today, they will come up because we're dealing, these are kind of key concepts in Max, so therefore they will come up uh, in the course of our, uh, our projects, okay? So let's talk MIDI controllers. I uh, said to you that if you have a MIDI controller, bring it today. If you have a MIDI controller that you didn't bring today, uh, it's still fair game for doing your projects. If you do not have a MIDI, your own MIDI controller, we have these lovely M-Audio keyboards that you can use for your project, okay? You must use a MIDI controller for controlling your instrument, okay? Um, what, what that MIDI controller is is up to you, okay? Uh, I will say one thing. We have these other Roland keyboards in here. Roland, in their wisdom, decided to quit issuing updates for that keyboard uh, to the latest operating system, basically. So they do not work with these computers, not because they, I mean, they have a USB port, you can plug them in, you can use them, but there is no driver for that keyboard for this operating system. So unfortunately, it will not work. So if you go to grab a keyboard out of the closet over there, make sure you grab one of the M-Audio ones, not the Roland ones, okay? Uh, I've got four of them here today. It'd be good for you to work in groups on this. Oh, Leo did bring a MIDI controller. Awesome. Okay, so uh, Leo's group gets to work on that. Okay, uh, but you could also your group mate could work on this as well. I mean, uh, there's nothing prohibiting you from having multiple MIDI devices either. Okay, if you want to be able to control it with multiple devices, you just kind of make sure you've got the drivers squared away and all that sort of stuff. And I don't know, is it, does that does that plug and play? Do you have to download it? Plug and play, perfect. These should be plug and play too. So each, it, it 
might be good for you to work in your groups today on this task of getting MIDI keyboards working. So here's your keyboard. Take your keyboard or take a keyboard and gather in your group, okay? Um, because what we're going to do today is actually get these keyboards uh, sending data into Max and then hopefully turn that data into sound. Okay, the first priority is getting the data into Max. Uh, all of these need a USB cable. There's probably a handful of USB cables in one of those closets. I don't know, Dylan, can you look in there and see if there's... If you find them. If not, you can always unplug the audio interface and plug it in that way. But if you want the audio interface and the keyboard, which uh, you should use the audio interface or at least use headphones if you're in here working outside of class. Yes? Okay. But you do need a, uh, some method of connecting it to the computer. If you end up using unplugging the audio interface, just make sure you plug it back in when you're done, okay? Um, once you plug it into the computer, and I'll, I'll just say this while we're getting started here, folks. I realize some people are looking for cables and getting plugged in, okay? Um, I don't know that's in the dock. Let me look at the dock here. It's not, okay. One thing you want to look for on these uh, Mac machines, okay, is just to make sure that this device actually talks to it. Hi. You're Chris? Okay. Okay. Have a seat. We're going to need to get you in a group, but um, for, today, for today, let's see. Can you, who can adopt Chris for today? One of these two groups of two. Here you go. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Sit down. So, um, to make sure that your MIDI device is talking to your computer, not Macs, I want to talk, make sure it's talking to the computer first, okay? There's a program called Audio MIDI Setup. Uh, the easiest way to find a program that's not in the dock is just to use command spacebar and then search for it. So if you just type in audio, it should be the first hit. Okay. Uh, now the default might be audio devices. If you want to then see show MIDI window under window, there it is. Okay, and you either have a a bunch of ghostly boxes, which basically means the driver is installed but it doesn't see that device, or you have a bunch of solid things. You have this keyboard in solid form. What do you got? You have it's there. Okay, good. Now, is yours? Well, we're going to kind of work in groups, so you can okay. kind of work together on this. Yeah. Is yours being seen? Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, you're not, not seen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 See that there to make sure the power is on, okay? Um, I will, let's see, I'm going to use this one. So I've got a, a few other controllers here that, I, that are in my personal collection. I like these cord ones, okay? Uh, this, this was the micro control, okay? It's actually a beast in terms of weight and ruggedness because it's got these metal side panels, basically. But the nice thing is it's got a keyboard, it's got percussion pads, it's got sliders, it's got knobs. It's, it's kind of handy in that regard. Um, then Korg said, well, we've gone micro, let's go nano, and they put out these little line of nano controllers. Uh, if you're looking for a cheap MIDI interface, these are kind of nice because I think, uh, I think all of them are under 50 bucks, which is pretty cheap for a, a MIDI controller uh, these days. And you can buy the one that's just sliders, you can buy one that's just a little keyboard, or you can buy one that's just a little percussion pads, basically. And the nice thing is they're not any wider than your computer keyboard, so they sit right in front of your computer keyboard. You connect them via USB. Um, I'm trying to think which one I'll... Uh, I'll go with the key. That way I can... Yeah, because I need note-on information. Okay? So I'll go with my keyboard today. I'm plugging in. i got to make sure mine shows up. Otherwise, I won't be able to demonstrate things for you. But all the things I'm going to demonstrate are pretty much... Uh, controller agnostic and that they should work with their techniques that should work with any controller okay turning on uh, there it is okay so you see how mine is in here okay 
that's basically how you can tell this this window is the one place where you can go in the operating system and you can see if your controller has been recognized by the operating system okay and you can see I've got several different audio uh, MIDI devices here uh, drivers okay so now we've done that let's talk uh, devices in Macs if you haven't launched Macs go ahead and launch Macs okay and I'm gonna go ahead and start a new project okay I'm gonna do this too I found last time on the recording I had a lot of stuff that was at the top of the window and I kept having to like move the window up and down when I was editing the recording afterwards. I'm going to save myself some time. Um, okay, so everybody got a new window open. Everybody's uh, got their device being recognized, okay? Um, let's see here. Let me talk objects here, okay? So here's the MIDI input objects that I want to focus in on today. Go ahead and create four new objects with these names, okay? Uh, what's... there's Two primary ways we talked about creating new objects. What's one of them, Robert? What's one way to create a new object in the Max window? Uh, you can press N. Yeah, N to create a new object. Okay. What's the other way, uh, Michael? Uh, the other way you can use the uh, explorer on the side. Yeah. Drag, so and drop. drag and drop from the explorer. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and do that in my patch here. Okay. So I'm going to do new MIDI in. I'm going to do new note in. I'll do a new, and I'll just do this, make it bigger. I like bigger. Okay. New um, control in. Uh, and even though it's CTL, uh, people tend to say control. That's what it's a, it's a concatenation of the word control. Okay. So if you hear me say control in, don't type out control in, just CTL in. And the other one was bend in. Okay. Uh, we've got three, well, Let's see. How should I do this? Let me do, I'll do uh, first things first. Uh, so we talked about the how to print stuff to the Max window yesterday. Anybody remember the object for that? Print, yes. The appropriately named print. Okay. So go ahead and create a print object and connect it to your MIDI in. And if everything's functioning right, you should be able to, let's see. No, nope, nothing's happening here. Go here. Ah, okay. Go ahead and do that and then tap on your keyboard to see if anything happens in the max window. Mine did not, and I, I want to make sure you got a winner. you're getting results. Are you guys getting results here? Yeah. No, okay. When you're not getting results, like I'm not getting results right now, okay? Go ahead and lock your patch, okay? And if you click on the MIDI in object, or this goes for any of these MIDI input objects, okay, you'll get a little drop down list. Mine's actually set to IAC driver, which is Inner Application Communications driver. It's actually a way that you can send MIDI information between software applications on a Mac, okay? So you could actually create a MIDI composition in uh, Logic or Finale or Pro Tools and have it send MIDI data over to Macs for processing. It's built right in, right here. You just double click IAC bus, boom, you're ready to go, okay? Uh, I actually wanna get the MIDI in from my microcontrol, okay? So I'm just gonna choose that in my list, and now I should be, no? I'm not getting data, awesome, still. Did that fix yours? Okay. I love it when things work for the students and not for me. Because I'm getting nothing out of my MIDI in. I should be getting raw data. Let's try this again here. MIDI in. Oh, I was going to say, maybe it's a different port. Yeah. Let me try it this way, too. Because sometimes... Micro... Control... Awesome. Okay. I might have to switch devices just to get actual MIDI data. This is not, let me check real quick. I'm on USB, plugged in. Let me try and connect my other device here. It's gonna be a really fun demonstration if I can't get Bobby MIDI going in here. Let's see what this one does.
nothing from that either. Yeah. Ah, okay, I got input from my, uh, okay. So my nanocontroller started outputting data. Okay, good. So you should see that you've got some sort of strange stream of numbers here, yes? What do you notice about these numbers? Any any patterns that you see developing as you play on the keyboard as you uh, press a key and see what sets of six? Sets of six, okay. And actually, uh, I'll, let me ask you to do one thing. Press the key down and wait, and then let go of the key and wait, and then yeah, three, right, each direction, okay. So one thing you'll notice about your keyboard is there's there's a message, there's a group of messages that come when you play, press a key down, and then another mess, group of messages when you release the key, okay. These are known as node-ons and node-offs, okay. But you should see that they're coming in in streams of three, okay. And that, that goes for any, if you've got, these keyboards all have uh, little pitch wheels on the side. Those actually will produce MIDI data. And there's a slider as well. There's one slider on the keyboard that produces data. So go ahead and move that around and see if you get numbers coming out of, into the window. Yeah? OK. Uh, what do you notice about the range of these numbers? What's the biggest number you see on the screen? Uh, 176. 176, OK. Yeah, you've probably seen a lot of 176s, right? 224s. 224s, okay. 224s. Some 145s. Okay. Uh, and so uh, knowing what you know about binary numbers, okay, because I know you've all taken a digital arts class somewhere along the lines, right? Uh, what range of numbers do you think we should expect out of MIDI based on what you're observing? 224 is the highest one we've 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 heard, right? Was it 224? Is that what you said? 224? Yeah. So what do you think is the range of MIDI note number no, numbers coming out of a MIDI data stream? If you had to guess. 100. Well, you've already exceeded 100. So 250 what? Oh, like 255. 255. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Ah. Remember the whole binary counting thing? Okay. Two, 0 to 255 is a kind of uh, as a common range, okay? And in fact, 0 to 127 shows up a lot because that's half the range, okay? Because there's another place that the data gets used. So you're going to see a lot of things between 0 and 255 and a lot of things between 0 and 128, okay? Uh, that's because MIDI is an 8-bit system at its core, okay? It's actually passing 8-bit messages, and so each one of these numbers is actually an 8-bit message that's coming in from your MIDI device, okay? Uh, it just so happens that they come in groups of three, so you're getting three 8-bit messages with each MIDI event, okay? So I just want to point that out before we get into the, the specifics of this, okay? Um, so MIDI in, if you haven't guessed or you didn't, if you didn't read the description here, uh, it says down here at the bottom, out, output raw MIDI stream, okay? And that's exactly what MIDI in does. It's it's a raw MIDI stream. It's every MIDI piece of inf information that's coming in from a device, okay? Um, now, we typically want to be more specific with that, okay? We want to actually use a specific type of MIDI data, okay? And that's where the other three objects come in, okay? We've got three objects, we've got three groups. So go ahead, you guys open up the help patch for node in. Uh, Michael, you guys open up the help patch for uh, control in, and Monica, you're gross. you guys uh, open up the, the help patch for bend in, okay? Read through the help patch real quick in like two minutes, and then uh, we'll report back. So let's everybody look at node in, and let's do this. Rather than open up the help patch, if you just uh, click and drag some number boxes over here, and connect them to the three outlets, okay? Um, and I'll use my trick of option click dragging to quickly get information out of them. Yeah, could, is it option. I think it's option click drag. Yeah, option click drag lets you copy something over. Okay. So I've got my node in device, and even though I, I this is, uh, I think uh, I'll come back to. But even though I don't, I don't have any keys on this, right? I don't have a keyboard. 
But I press this and I should, let's see, oh, make a liar out of me, right? I'm going to get rid of this print over here because I don't want that print into the max window. All devices by channel, yeah, it should be. Oh, I guess these are all, yeah, all devices. There we are. Hey, look at that. There's my note in information. Okay, so go back to what you said, Colby. I was doing it. Okay, yeah. So, uh, but explain it a little bit more. I mean, as you're playing with the keyboard, what's happening? Uh, now the numbers are in it. Are you talking about? Yeah. Um, the first one is uh, the first number you see from the right outlet is mm -hmm. the channel that the uh, MIDI is operating on. Here, okay. And the second one is the velocity. In other words, how hard you hit the the note, and the last one. Might so channel. Velocity. Pitch. Okay. So what you should notice, and if you if you uh, have built this little bit of patch, or if you open up the help patch, you should see something similar to this, basically. Um, to really see what's going on here, you need to slow down your, I mean, the typical uh, uh, first play around with the MIDI keyboard is just to kind of press a bunch of stuff and see these, these stream of numbers. But if you slow down a little bit, press a key down, okay, you'll see that I just pressed key number 69, that's pitch number 69, then velocity, the heart, the, 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 the quickness with which I pressed the key is 47, and then it's on channel 1, okay? Um, now pitch, let's see, if I press this really key, really hard, let me see if I can, there, I can hit 127, okay? It tops out at 127, okay? There's that whole binary counting thing again, okay? It comes back to bite us, okay? It, you can't press a key faster than 127, and you can't press it softer than about, uh, I don't know if I can get, yeah, eight, eight is as low as it's going to, and this, this will vary from device to device. Some of the variation in, in key, MIDI keyboards is strictly based on touch. People like the way they feel. These, these don't, these aren't, these and yours are not weighted keys, right? Okay, so they're not, um, they don't have the feel of a piano and the hammers and that sort of stuff, right? Okay, um, but you can get some variation in velocity here just based on how hard you press it. And then when you release the key, what do you see? Zero. Okay, um, and it all comes in the order that things happen. So if I press, uh, let's see, I press the F and then I'll go up to the C. You see how I get, that's the uh, velocity of the C. But then if I release the F, I'm going to see the zero from the F, then the zero from the C. Okay. So you have to kind of, um, I don't know, if you thought about keyboard playing on a note by note basis, you have to start thinking of it as note ons and note offs. Okay. That's how MIDI deals with. Uh, pitch events, okay, if you want to call them that. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, uh, this is going to be key for all of you because you're going to be building instruments that you play with, you play with your MIDI device, okay, so you're, and you're probably going to want to have pitched information. You can use the keyboard to do that, okay. Um, let's see, oh, I, I promised you we would make some sound, so let's, I don't know, do you want to finish the MIDI input objects and then make some sound, or do you want to make some sound right now? Later, okay. So, uh, you spoke loudly and first, so therefore we're going to go with that, okay? Let that be a lesson to all of you, okay? Uh, uh, let's see. So, control in. Tell us about that. Uh, it, receives, uh, it outputs the value from the specific uh, control in number on the MIDI chain. Uh, okay. It reads in the sliders, the other controllers that aren't MIDI, or the, the keys. Not the keys on the keyboard, right? Okay, and I'm going to cheat real quick here. I've got this unlocked, so I'm going to click and drag. I can select all these. And I'll use my option click drag trick again. Okay, it works on multiple objects, people. It will save you a lot of time when you need to replicate parts of your patch. Okay, uh, but it's no longer pitch, velocity, and channel. Let's see. Let me play this here. Ah, okay. So this is now value. This is actually the control number. And then the last one is channel. Are you going to see this with a label that 
I yeah, I can post this to the uh, YouTube. Uh, I'll post it as a message to the YouTube That'll recording. Okay. Thank yeah, you. that's what I did on class uh, Tuesday. Um, okay, so value. So you see, I, I've, I'm grabbing one slider and I'm moving it up. Okay, and you all have one slider on these keyboards. So if you want more sliders, sorry, you're gonna have to find another MIDI device. Again, fifty bucks or less, right? Okay. Um, but if you uh, move it up and down, you see that the number that it, I've designated as the controller number doesn't change as I'm moving a single slider. But if I then change to the second one, oh, it's actually coming in. Mine are actually grouped by channel number. Interesting. Channel, yeah. Specific. Just with each slider. Let me confirm. Yeah, controller number, MIDI channel. Okay, so th this uh, my manufacturer here has determined that rather than number these by channel, uh, by controller number, they actually are sending them on different channels. So it actually all reads as channel set or, or controller seven, but on different channels. Why did it select seven? Hmm? Why did it choose not one but seven? Seven is volume. Oh. Okay, so yeah, this is a good question, Aiden. So let's see here. Uh, if we Google MIDI controller numbers. There are actual designations for these controller numbers, okay? And I'll do this real quick. I'll grab this, wake up. I like to do this in the middle of class when you guys need a link so you don't lose track of it. There you go, 461, mini controller numbers. Doink, send, okay? You can check it later, all right? Uh, as we see, seven, main volume, okay? Mine happens to be mapped, I think one of the default configurations for this is to use this with your DAW so that you're actually controlling the volume on different channels. Okay, now it doesn't have to stay that way and I could either spend hours reprogramming this hardware device to change its channel numbers or I can simply in Max remap it to something else. Now that I know how to identify the difference between this slider and this slider, I can easily just patch it to a different part of my patch. A different part of my algorithm basically okay it doesn't have to stay volume it's just that uh, this is kind of like standard encoding for where where these uh, numbers are gonna go okay uh, let's see so it actually is different I believe on this one yes yeah so I'm now I'm playing with my nano control if I grab slider one that's actually controller two and then I get controller three controller four you see how the controller number is changing not the channel number Okay, um, that's I guess just a different in the way the default setup is here basically. Okay, um, channel numbers basically give you the ability to identify different devices in your setup. Okay, um, there are 16 channels in MIDI. Okay, you'll never see a channel higher than 16. Okay, <clears throat> you can think of it as the same way as channels in broadcasting. Okay, if you're watching channel. Uh, I don't, know, uh, you, I don't know. What's what? Where's NBC on the dial? I don't have cable, so I don't know. Eight. eight. Okay. If NBC is on eight, okay. Everybody understands that when you're tuned into channel eight, ABC doesn't stop broadcasting just because you're tuned into channel eight. It's still broadcasting over here on channel six, right? Okay. It's a matter of what you're tuned into, and you can use that from device to device to make sure that. Um, the device you want receiving the information is getting the information you want it to receive, okay, while it's still listening on all the channels, okay. So channel is selectable not just on the broadcasting end, but also the receiving end, or I should say transmitting end and the receiving end, okay. So that's a good way to think of it, okay. Um, trying to think if there's anything else to say about control in. I don't think so. So let's get to bend in. Tell us about bend in. Somebody from Robert Aiden Monica over there. Uh, it says output pitch and values received from a MIDI device. The MIDI port and channel can be chosen with messages and by double clicking on the object. Okay. So where what is pitch? Did you find that one of your controllers on your keyboard actually activated this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a pitch bend wheel on your keyboard, right? This is an object specifically made for the pitch bend wheel, okay? And mine has a little joystick, basically, so I, I get to... It's only the X dimension. The Y dimension is actually a controller, so you see how that's moving on that, okay? 
Um, and this is actually where video would be helpful, right? If I'm, I'm sitting here doing this in front of the camera and no one can see what I'm doing. Uh, I can't do it in the middle of the recording. Let's see here. Quick time to the rescue. Turn on my webcam. Awesome. There I am. Okay. So um, moving the wheel up and down versus left to right. Okay. I get pitch bend information versus controller information. Is what I'm doing here with my my cord microcontroller. Okay. Um, I can just put that in the background. Um, then we uh, let me think. So for you, you've got a you've got a bend wheel, and you've also got a control wheel as well. What is different in terms of the physical setup of those things, those devices, the hardware on the actual keyboard? They're, they're looking very similar. Oh, the, the pitch bend has its it reverts back to its original position. Yeah. Whereas the other one just doesn't have a lock on; it's just loose, and you can set it yeah. to oscillate at different. So the pitch bend, right? That's exactly right. And the the pitch bend wheel is always going to snap back to that center position. Okay. And think about the way pitch bend is used on a synthesizer. You're, you're bending the pitch up kind of as you're playing the note, and then you're, you want to let go of it quickly and have it reset so that the next, work, the next uh, pitch is not bent. Okay, that's, that's the intent there of having the spring. So the pitch bend wheel is always going to have that spring in it so that it pops back to the, the normal position or the, the center position. Okay, again, we're seeing values from 0 to 127, and 64 is in the middle. Okay because it's technically 128, right? So 64 being the middle, okay? Um, so you can use that to your advantage if you want to have a pitch bend effect in your instrument, okay? So you've got three different items here, okay? Uh, we want to make some sound with these. I think I've covered everything on my list, yes. Ah, before we make sound, let's skip ahead to this and talk about uh, things for viewing MIDI information. Okay, we've already looked at print, right? You already know number box. Let's look at these two objects here. You've got a keyboard and you've got a notation device, okay? For those of you that uh, need to be able to see this information uh, graphically, okay, let me skip, skip back over here. Uh, I'm going to unlock, I'm going to make it a little bit smaller, move you guys all up here, okay? I'm going to move control and pitch bend over to the side for now. And I want to look at my uh, pitch graphically. So if I scroll down here, where is it at? Is it, or is it at the top? Ah, OK, I can get to it here. UI objects should show me. Where is it at? Sliders, there they are. So there's an N slider, and there's a K slider, are the names of the objects. And again, for UI, for user interface objects, I can go ahead and hit N, and I can actually type in K slider. So if you can remember the name, you can just have it pop up that way. Okay. Sometimes that's faster than the two minutes I just searched through the, the Explorer over there. Okay. Um, but they're both considered sliders. So if I go ahead and take the Take the output from your number box on pitch and connect them over to these sliders. Oh, I didn't want to take the word pitch. I want that. Okay. And if I do that and play now, I get a real time output of what it is I'm playing. Isn't that great? Okay. So if you need to be able to visualize this, if you can't remember that. Uh, 60 is middle C, okay, which eventually, uh, by the end of this class, you should have you should be able to remember that 60 is middle C, okay? Um, and then because there are 12 notes in a, in a chromatic scale, the next C up is 72. The next C up is 72 plus 12 is 84, okay? The next C below 60 is 12, 12 down is, yeah, okay? So you start to get to know uh, where these MIDI note numbers are, okay, relative to each other, okay. Um, and when we get into algorithmic composition, these numbers will become even more important because we'll start to compose using these numbers, uh, you know, defining a scale based on what its MIDI note numbers are, and then having it improvise on that scale, basically. Those those types of things. We'll get to that. Yeah. Why is it only recognized one note at a time? Uh, ah, it actually, it's. Uh, let me think how to how to say this correctly. Well, 
First, MIDI is a serial communication standard. It's not parallel. So when you press keys simultaneously, it still has to transmit the data sequentially. So it, it will use the milliseconds in between each key to determine which one is happening first. I mean, it's, it's fast, but it's still, there is a theoretical limit to how quickly it can trigger notes, okay? But for the purposes of this class, you probably will not encounter any problems, but you're seeing them one at a time, and they're happening, because they're happening sequentially, when you press a chord, what you're seeing is probably uh, the last note that was played, the last one you actually hit. Aiden. I recall having like a problem with that when I was trying to use MIDI, just using like, Logic and other mm -hmm. DWs, and I remember fixing it just inside of like a plugin I had. I had to, you had to make it listen to all voices, basically. Would that basically be adding like more channel numbers, and they're just taking them all as individual? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll, well, I'll put this out there because you are going to be, I mean, for this first project, my expectation is that this would be a, a monophonic device, yeah. not a polyphonic device, okay? So that means it's able to play one pitch at a time, okay? I, it, you should be able to do that, okay? Um, if you want to dive into it and really get it working polyphonically, that would be kind of, that's gravy as far as I'm concerned for this first project, okay? Eventually, we'll want to build polyphonic synthesizers, but... For a first project, having a good, solid monophonic synthesizer, no, there's no shame in that, okay? Some of the best-selling synthesizers of all time are monophonic, okay? Okay? Dave Smith, Moog, you know, all sorts of things. Okay. Um, okay. Um, let me think. What else? Oh, these, uh, this controller is actually, the, especially the keyboard, it's not just a display device. You can actually control with this. So if I, uh, let me do this. I'll click and drag down here and down here. So there's actually, you'll notice there's outlets on this keyboard. So in addition to displaying MIDI information, I can actually play with this keyboard. This might be a good uh, device to throw in your eventual project patch for times when you don't have your hardware controller around. Okay, so that you can actually test it just in the software interface. Make sense? So that use it both as a controller and a display. That's fair game. And I can do the same thing with this note slider as well. The, a box on the right. Which box? Like the left Here? Is pitch. That's pitch, so it's the other number box. That's velocity. Oh, uh, okay. And how, it, how, you, how does it determine velocity, you might add? It's, it's not how, how hard I press the mouse, okay? It's actually the vertical dimension uh, on the key. Okay, because computers don't tell you, don't give you a mouse velocity. They just give you mouse click, mouse down, mouse up. Okay, or at least most computers. Okay, most mice. Yeah. Okay. So the the position on the key is determines the velocity. Okay. Uh, let's see. Back to my. Okay, so I've covered these. So let's build a simple tone generator. You should know most of these objects from last time, right? We covered cycle, right? We covered multiply tilde, right? What does cycle do? Eric, do you remember what cycle does? I did something along the lines of assigns a value from 0 to 512. Oh, uh, no, yeah, we used 512, right? That was what we were, we had like all the outlets that was showing you the difference between the max and the, the the uh, MSP object. So yeah, you're remembering correctly, but you're not remembering the actual function of it. Who can help Eric out here? What does cycle do? And if you're quick, you can pull up the help patch and yes. Yeah. Sinusoidal uh, oscillator. Yeah. Sinusoidal sinus oscillator. So it, it generates a sine wave. Okay. Or if you want to be really technical, which I would never mark you off on a test, not that there are any tests in this class, I would never mark you off for calling it a sine wave generator when it's actually a cosine generator. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Again, where's our, where's our, your guys are spectral, Michael and Eric, you guys are spectral models, right? Yeah. Okay, so sine waves and cosine waves is kind of important for that, but you'll read about that, okay? Um, okay, so sinusoidal oscillator, okay, generates a sine wave. Those, those nice pure tones that we use on hearing tests, okay? What does the multiply tilde do? Aiden, you, I don't know. You don't know? Monica, do you remember? Um. Yeah, okay, we're multiplying it, but we're multiplying the sine waves coming out of the cycle object, and we're going to multiply it by another number to scale it so that it's louder or softer, okay? 
So we're using it as a way to control amplitude here. Okay. Now that then is going to the speaker. The speaker causes sound to go out. Okay, of the computer. Okay, so that's the known. Then we've got a couple unknowns here. Okay, so I mentioned 127 being an important range of numbers, right? And you should have noticed as you were playing with velocity on your keyboard, right? There's there was nothing outside of zero to 127. Okay, so what are the implications of me dividing by 127 dot? Think, think about that input, map, transform, output, okay? I just told you the input is going to be between 0 and 127, right? Okay? If I then, if, if my map transform in the middle is divide by 127 dot, what is that going to do? You've got many different Well, what? Think even simpler. We're... We're performing math on it, and we're going to divide it by 127, right? Yeah? Yeah, okay. So my output is going to, it's going to result in output that is between 0 and 1. Fractional values between 0 and 1, okay? Because think of... Uh, easiest way to do this, if you know the range of the input, 0 to 127, you know what the transform function is, Think about the extremes, okay? 0 divided by 127 is 0. 127 divided by 127 is 1, okay? The fact that I put the dot there means that it's going to use floating point math, so I'm going to get fractional values. So I'm going to get floating point numbers between 0 and 1 as my output, okay? So I'm taking the velocity coming out of node n, I'm turning it into numbers between 0 and 1, okay? But not just simply 0 or 1, but 0, 0 0.2, 0.23, yeah. So if you put a number higher than 127, it would be louder? If you put a number lower than 27, because yeah. it's, yeah. yeah, because it's division. So you could, yeah, you could adjust the velocity that way, or the, the way it, it maps to amplitude, okay? Uh, then we have this other uh, crazy acronym here, MTOF, and this is not some sort of uh, tweet speak uh, acronym sort of thing, okay? Although I, well, maybe we should start the MTOF hashtag. Um, anyway, it's very simple. If you open up the help patch, I think you'll get it pretty quickly. Convert a MIDI note number to frequency, right? So, Cycle likes to talk in terms of frequency, but if you simply connect note in to your cycle, okay, this gets back to that input map transform thing, okay? Uh, we are outputting, if we're outputting MIDI note numbers, but our cycle object is expecting frequencies, we're probably not going to get the sonic results that we're after, although they might be interesting and we might decide to go off in that direction, basically. But fundamental to understanding it is to understand that one of them is producing numbers that represent MIDI note numbers, the other one is expecting frequencies, so therefore, we need something to convert between them, and the MTOF object is just that. So, let's build this patch out. Okay, so, I've got my MTOF here. I'm going to put another one over here, and you can feel free to follow along if you haven't already started building your patch. But this should result in a patch that makes noise based on my keyboard input. If you wanted to see the frequency, would you just make a number, a number box out of the output of the MTOF? Uh, yes, and in fact, it's probably going to be a floating point number, so I would use a float num, and I'll do just that, just so you can see what it's doing. Good question. And then I want to do an easy DAC. Oh, not easy ADAC, but I want Easy DAC. There it is. Okay. So let me make this a little bit bigger. Okay. Moment of truth. If I turn this on now, I'll lock it, turn it on, play my keyboard, turn my sound up. I need 
to connect my velocity so that I get my node offs. Okay. Now turn it on. I've, I've got a very, very simple monophonic sine wave player. Go ahead and get this working if you haven't already. Make sure you get this working on your some nice crunchy starts and beginnings there. get this working before I start talking project stuff. Yes. Um, just have it saved. So, yeah, yeah, so you're talking about um, when you play a key that it interrupts. Because yeah. what's happening, you have to think about it. <coughs> Hold on. <coughs> Something went on the wrong way there. Um, you have to think about it in terms of what's happening in terms of messages. So what's happening is a note on message is arriving. Then another note on is arriving, okay, and because it's monophonic, when you let go of either key, it's telling it note off, and it was only playing one note to begin with, okay? You got to think through message by message in order to kind of understand the logic of what's going on, okay? It, I admit, it's awkward, but it, it takes a while to get your head around what's going on. Now, I, that's not to say we, we won't stay monophonic forever, okay? There are ways to create polyphonic instruments. Otherwise, I mean, we wouldn't have polyphonic uh, software synthesizers. But uh, for this first project, focus on getting the monophonic working and, that, and maybe some strategies for polyphonic, okay? We can talk about some of those. What? Ah, yeah. Well, actually, Tuesday I'm going to look at different so uh, waveforms, okay? Uh, which will feed into several of your research projects because you'll need like a sine wave or a saw wave or a square wave. Okay, there's there's generators for that. I'll talk about those on Tuesday. Um, if you want to look at those uh, in, in advance of Tuesday, let's see. Uh, if you open up the help patch on cycle, it should in the the question mark here. Put it toward the center here. The question mark on the help patch will always tell you like related projects. See also. Uh, yeah, so sawtooth, uh, rectangle, there's also anti-alias sawtooth, so these are all objects that will produce uh, different waveforms, okay? Is a trapezoid wave? What else? A trapezoid wave. Uh, what would that be? I guess that would be like a, just a... Oh, it's a mix of two? Saw wave that's like cut off at the top. Is that what, did you see that somewhere? Yeah, trapezoid. Trapezoidal wave table? Awesome, okay figure out what that sounds like. Okay, so uh, with the time that I have left, and hopefully you know more than that, uh, let me talk about your projects, right? Because you're all wondering what it is we're supposed to be doing for this, right? Okay, I will uh, hearken back to the syllabus, okay? Your syllabus says, and this is definitely something we need to elaborate on here, okay? Uh, working in groups of two or more. Okay, check. We've got that taken care of. Okay, you're supposed to research pr professor-provided technical and historical topics both online and in the library. Okay, that's intentional that I put that there. Okay, because uh, uh, yeah, I, I do want you to use the library for this. Okay, um, incorporate your research findings into original implementations. Uh, and I want you to then develop a viable performance instrument using Maximus P, and you present that to your peers. Not just the project, but also the history and the technical bit, too, okay? So you're responsible for kind of giving us the whole package, okay? So, for instance, if you, uh, Monica and your group, if you were to pick frequency modulation, okay, you might give us a little bit of a history of, like, when it was developed, who are some of the key researchers that helped develop it, what are some... Uh, commercial synthesizers where frequency, mod frequency modulation shows up and was important to give us a little bit of a history timeline, talk us through the basic understanding of how it works, and then show us your instrument that implements frequency modulation, okay? Um, and when I say show it, I mean, you should do a little bit more. I mean, there's a tendency for these little instrument demonstrations to be like, look, 
the low keys are down here and the high keys are up here and that's what it does basically. Um, try to give us a little musical demonstration of what you can do with your synthesis technique, okay? Um, I tried to mix up the groups so there's at least someone in the group that identifies themselves as having musical capabilities, okay? Even if it's as simple as playing, you know, something not too complex. I just played hot cross buns for goodness yeah. sakes, but even playing hot cross buns is more uh, a better demonstration of low keys, high keys. Isn't that great? You know, loud, soft, okay? Think, try to think in more, um, I don't know, more nuanced demonstration than that, okay? Can we all agree? Okay. Um, so, how, okay, so everybody's got their topics, and I've already said you're not responsible for all of these, okay? Uh, you're responsible for picking some topics, and you might in your research show, find out that uh, this is actually something I can implement in two weeks. This is something I would take me all semester to implement this, and so that I'm not going to do that, okay? Um, that's part of the process is figuring out where, what it, what's achievable in the timeline that you have, okay? I expect that to be part of the process. Um, and Leo and Colby, I don't know, you've been working with Chris. You want to adopt Chris into your group on a permanent basis? Okay, so Chris is now part of Leo and Colby's group, okay? Michael and Eric are still the team of two. We stay strong at two. Okay, no pressure. Uh, project development. Okay, what's the best way to go about this? This is the, uh, okay. This is my kind of like animated slides to describe my ideal way of going about this research project. Okay, you we're, we're supposed to be. This is the these are the learning outcomes that we're working toward. Okay, your ability to research, comprehend, and implement stuff. Your ability to apply your creative and aesthetic abilities, and also then giving a presentation. Okay, so how to do this? I've given you topics, right? You should go do some research on those topics. Okay, read about them both online and in the library. Okay, don't just start by blindly fumbling around, throwing objects together, trying to figure out what sounds cool. Okay, that's that's a I don't know, that you might discover something that sounds cool, but you probably will not implement the actual technique that I've assigned to you, okay? That's at least what my history with this class has shown me, okay? Students that just blindly string things together, they'll be like, I, I came up with this really cool sounding patch. Well, but I assigned you frequency modulation to, uh, to actually implement, and it, this is not frequency modulation, okay? So do some research, okay? Learn some things about the history. Learn some things about the techniques involved, okay? You're going to then Put that together and call that your knowledge and understanding about the, the topic, okay? You're going to take that knowledge and understanding and you're going to translate it into Max MSP land, okay? You're going to then, okay, eventually end up with a patch and you're going to listen to that patch and if it sounds good, you, you know, you'll refine it and keep working on it. If it doesn't sound good, it doesn't sound right, you can go back and research it some more, okay? There should be a feedback loop created here between research and knowledge and understanding and max MSP, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, does my animated slides help explain yeah, what I'm talking about? Okay, thank you, okay. Okay, so, uh, but the key here is, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of people want to start here because I think this is a max class, so I gotta start by implementing in max. Start here and then apply it to max MSP, please, okay? Um, and if you do start here, it should, you know, if you get something that doesn't sound right, it should feed you back to research and lear learning more about it and applying it to Max MSP, okay? Um, primary source. I do expect you to, to, to investigate some primary sources, okay? Um, I don't expect there to be exclusively primary sources, okay? So, for instance, I mean, Car Plus Strong, if you go dig up, if you dig, you can find the original Car Plus Strong paper in the library with the resources that are at your hand, okay? Um, it will probably be too dense for you to understand in isolation, okay? But you can then uh, look at other sources, secondary sources, that kind of break it down for you, explain what's going on, and go from there, okay? Um, I do want you to start digging and, and as the semester keeps going, get into more and more primary sources where people are talking about their own research, okay? That's really what a primary source in, in computer music means. Like, I did this research, I developed this technique, or we did this research, we developed this technique, here's how it works, okay? 
Um, I do want you to start getting at that level. The closer you can get to that, the more enriching experience this is going to be. Okay. Um, I don't expect you to end there, though, because, like I said, some of those original papers are a little dense for people that are two weeks into computer music. Okay. Um, I, I, I will give you that. Okay. Are there other? Does that clarify what I mean by getting at the primary sources? Okay. How are you going to do that? Uh, well. Uh, I don't want anyone to tell me that there's nothing in the library about computer music because as my uh, as I put up here on Blackboard, where am I going to find stuff in the library, okay? In 2009, in working with this class, we put together a, a, a bibliography of everything that was in the library in 2009 that had to do with computer music, okay? Okay? And, you know, I even made it easier. I put the call numbers in here too, okay? So it's very easy. And I put a few notes like what it's about. So this one's about machine listening, okay? Um, that's probably not relevant for this first synthesis project, but when we get to the machine listening project for project four, it probably is relevant, okay? Um, I tagged where some things are just basically history, okay? You're not going to find technical details in there, but you might find some interesting historical tidbits, okay? The ones at the top here, okay? Here's our textbook, but then we've got these four overview texts. Uh, I haven't done this yet, but I, I need to head over to the library and put these on reserve because I, I don't want people to uh, check this out and then hog it basically for the duration of the semester, okay, which was completely possible. So give me a chance to walk over to the library, hopefully this afternoon, and put these on reserve. If you get them checked out before I get them on reserve, kudos to you, uh, but I will ask you to return it and let's put it on reserve for the class. When it's on reserve, you can, you can check it out for 24 hours and then bring it back. That's a more equitable, I mean, I'd, I'd say... Every topic is discussed in these four books. So that's why we want to have them on reserve so everybody can get access to them, okay? Not having you check it out for once and then monopolize it for the whole semester, okay? Um, let's see. I think... Oh, yeah. NIL means not in the library. Uh, but if you see a, 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 a underline here, it's actually a link. So if I click on this... This book is actually online, so you can actually read Miller Puckett's book. And it, Miller Puckett is a name that should ring a bell at some point, or no? Not yet. It will as you start to read our textbook. Okay. Uh, I think I've mentioned him in class. If I haven't, I'll leave it to you to as an exercise to figure out who Miller Puckett is and why he's important to Max. Okay. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Let's see. Topic. Okay. So I've given you the bibliography. Uh, in addition, we have a Computer Music Journal. Okay. Ninety. 1997 uh, to present is available via the library's website. It's all digital. You can download articles from Computer Music Journal. Uh, the library had physical copies of 1984 to 2005, uh, and they, in their wisdom, said, oh, we can remove these from the shelves because now we have it online. But if you look at the dates, uh, there's a gap from 84 to 97 that, they, that is not available digitally. Okay? It's in my office because when they said when they decided to get rid of it, they gave me a call and they said, "Hey, would you want these?" I was like, "Absolutely, I would like these in my office." Okay, so I have what was in the library formerly. Okay, so if you turn up a Computer Music Journal article in that time frame, I've got it in my office. Okay, and Computer Music Journal only goes back to 1978, um, so there's only a gap of six years that I don't have. Uh, the International Computer Music Association. I've got a link to that as well on the Blackboard site. See here, yeah. Here's the link to the searchable database for uh, ICMC proceedings, basically. Okay, and so you can actually search in some of these topics and see people that have uh, posted papers about them. Okay, um, those are certainly going to be primary sources. Okay, ICMC and Computer Music Journal. Okay, those are good places for uh, original sources. And some of the early computer music journals are actually reprinted. There's a volume in the library that's like, uh, it reprints several like key articles from the early years of uh, computer music journal. I'm blanking on the name, but Max Matthews is the editor, okay? Max Matthews is another name that's going to come up, okay? And there's the reason why Max is called Max, okay? It's named after Max Matthews, the uh, father of computer music, okay? Uh, looking at the time, we don't have time to discuss this, but I'll uh, take a look at on Blackboard, okay? How are these projects going to be graded? I put a link to the rubric I developed last time I taught this class in 2011, okay? 
Um, other people have taught it in the interim. I'm happy to be back teaching it because I like this topic. Okay, uh, I'm not shy about it. But my class, anyway. Uh, computer. This is the rubric for uh, the projects from last time. Okay, I am open to discussion about any changes that need to be made to this rubric. I don't feel like it needs to be set in stone, and I feel like you should have some agency in how you're being evaluated on these projects because they're your projects. Okay. Um, but I want to develop a, pr a rubric that we then use for all four projects, okay? Um, can I give, leave it to you for over the weekend to look at this rubric and see what makes sense, what doesn't make sense? I will say from my perspective, I, maybe I went a little overboard and I defined like every letter grade. Like in this r row, this is what constitutes an A, this is what constitutes a B, a C, etc. That was a little too fine a gradation and it sometimes slowed me down in the grading process to say okay was this a B or a C kind of thing. Uh, I kind of like to get the broader categories of like above expectations, meets expectations, below expectations, okay, and then develop letter grades from there, okay. Um, but take a look at that. Let me know what makes sense and what doesn't. We'll take some time to talk about that on Tuesday. Um, I'm also happy to, if you want to tweet or email me information, your opinions on that, okay. What I'm going to talk about on Tuesday, uh, I shuffled around the topics a little bit from the syllabus. So waveforms and envelopes and reading flowcharts. In, in doing your research, you're going to come across flowcharts that you're going to be looking at and go, how do I make this into a max patch? I'll talk about kind of dissecting some of that. Uh, and I'll also talk about why randomness is a good thing in synthesis. Uh, at least that's my opinion. And you know, being as I'm the professor and I'm evaluating your work, you might want to pay attention to that. Okay? Comments, questions? Kids. Yes. Is there a USB drive in this same patch? Uh, if you just plug, there are USB ports on the back. So if you just plug in there, there should be an available one. <coughs> okay. Anything else? Oh, uh, oh, maybe I should show you this. If you, uh, before you do that, Colby, this is a, qu a quick tip, bonus tip for today. Okay. Moving Max patches around. Okay. If you've got a Max patch, unlock it. Okay. Do a Command A to select everything, and then if you just do file, uh, no, edit, copy compressed, okay, then if you open up your favorite email editor or email client, okay, that's uh, not, I don't want an appointment, I want to email this to myself. I just paste it. That's actually a max patch in hexadecimal code. Uh, more than I think it's more than accessible, but this is like an encoded max patch. Okay, what I can then do is uh, I'll show you so that there's no magic involved. Let me quit max. Okay, I'll go back to this email that I just received from myself. If I select everything here and I do edit copy, and then I toggle back over to max, which I just quit. So let me do it. Open it back up. Okay, and then I go to file. New from clipboard after I've copied it, boom, there's my patch. Okay, so it's completely possible to just email patches to yourself as text. Okay, uh, it's also handy for saving, saving your work and backing it up, uh, trading it between group members, that sort of stuff. Okay, all right, I'll let you guys. What up? All it is is text. Yeah, no, it's going to need some virus. No, it's, it's, it's text in the body of the email at this point. And so it's, it's nothing different than if someone says, uh, please invest in my, uh, uh, you know, accept my wire transfer from this Western African print, you know, that, those, those kind of emails, okay? All right. See you guys Tuesday.